Okay, so here we are with lesson number four. Um, and this, this is all about um, basically the interference of light, but more specifically, um, the work of uh, Thomas Young, who was a British scientist and performed an experiment that really led um, scientists and physicists, you know, thinking along a certain path. And so I'm going to um, go over a little bit of uh, basically of casual history first, um, because it helps us to gain an appreciation. Basically, throughout history, scientists have debated over what light is. Okay, so for a long time, um, people thought that light was um, a particle, and um, the Greeks thought that light was um, particles that kind of streamed out of people's eyes. Um, other people thought that light was a wave, um, similar to how sound is a wave. But in general, this debate went back and forth, and Newton was one that thought that light was very much a particle. Because Newton was very well respected, um, his particle theory of light was mostly um, accepted and, and was certainly the, the most widely accepted um, theory of what light actually was, and that was based on his reputation. But the problem was, for a long time, um, the particle theory of light could explain certain things, but couldn't explain other phenomenon. And the wave theory of light, well, it did very well describing some other aspects, but didn't do very well describing these aspects over here, and, and so back and forth the argument went. So Robert Hooke, who you see up here, and Christian Huygens, who you see right here, they were really the champions of the wave theory of light. And um, as I just mentioned, it wasn't able to explain all of the phenomenon that the particle theory did. Um, and we've seen some evidence so far about the wave theory because it, it explains refraction very well. It explains polarization very well. But in the early 1800s, Thomas Young, who you see down here, um, who was a British scientist, of course, performed a very famous experiment that was unrefuted and it could only be explained if light was a wave. And so it gained quite a bit of um, it gained quite a bit of fame at the time because it was the first, you know, irrefutable proof that yes, light is a wave. So let's talk a little bit about interference theory. And we've we've touched on this when we talked about sound in grade eleven. But when we combine two or more waves, we use the principle of superposition to say that okay, waves either build each other up or they tear each other down. And when waves build each other up, we call this constructive interference. So when two waves meet at the same spot in space and time, um, the amplitude of both of those waves is said to be in the same direction and they build each other up. So we get a super croft, a su excuse me, a super crest or a super trough. Okay, destructive interference on the other hand is when two waves meet at the same point in space and time and the amplitude of those waves is in different directions and so they cancel each other out. Okay, now we've seen examples of this before. But basically what ends up happening is that either waves build each other up or they tear each other down. All right, so many things can cause waves to interfere, but the path difference between two waves has a very large effect because the path difference can create a difference in phase, and that's a phase shift. And you've probably talked about this in grade 11 math or in grade 12 math, but here's two very, very simple waves that have two different paths. So here's one wave, and this is very simplified. It isn't even it isn't even a sine curve. It's just a triangle wave, and here it starts out and it has a certain a certain phase. Okay, another wave that started off perhaps is exactly the same. This traveled maybe a different distance, will be phase shifted relative to that first wave, and because those two spots, those two waves will meet at the same point then they will have, of course, either a constructive effect or a destructive effect or some effect in between. Okay, because things don't necessarily have to be fully constructive or fully destructive. They could be anywhere in between. They could build each other up a little bit or build each other up very little. And so this is how a path difference will create interference. We did an example in grade 11 
where we walked around the classroom. We had two speakers that were playing a frequency and we walked around the classroom. And because of the phase difference, because of the difference in length of the sound waves that were traveling to hit our ears, you can actually find, if you walk around the classroom, spots of destructive interference where there's no sound, and structive, constructive interference where there's lots of sound. So when these two waves, though, meet in space and time, there's an infinite number of possible shifts that happen between them. They may be out of phase by one full wavelength. They may be out of phase by one half of a wavelength. They may be out of phase by 1.113 wavelengths, whatever. Right? The two extremes of phase shift are considered here. So when two waves arrive at one spot in phase, so they're shifted by an integral number of wavelengths, so an integer number m lambda of wavelengths, the net effect is constructive interference, and these two waves build each other up, so you get a maximum. So this would be constructive interference. Conversely, when two waves arrive completely out of phase, and so they're shifted by exactly m plus one half lambda, where m is an integer, so a half integer number of wavelengths, the net effect is destructive interference and a minimum occurs. Okay, So think about your sine wave. Of course, two sine waves that are off by one full wavelength. If you add them over top of each other, they would build each other up. Two sine waves that are shifted by one half of a wave would be exactly opposite. Their patterns would be exactly opposite. And they would cancel each other out. So the term node, we often use the term node, is to, de to describe a minimum. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at what Young did, because this is Young's double slit experiment. And he used a light source and two opaque cards um, with basically little holes in those cards. And he performed an experiment. Basically, it convinced most people that, that light was a wave. So on the first card, he punched a tiny little hole. And here you see the first card here, tiny little hole right here. And then through the second card, he placed two holes. So these were the two slits or the two pinholes. And so when he shone light through this first slit, it basically spread out like this. This basically created this coherent light source, which means it was in phase. These two slits were an equal distance from here to here, so we could be guaranteed that the light was in phase when it hit these two spots because it traveled an equal distance. And then all of a sudden, the light traveled through here, and one wave spread out here. And this traveled through here and spread out here. And what you can see are these points, these nodes, on where different waves are meeting. And you can see maximums occurring here along this nodal line, and you can see minimums occurring along the antinodal lines. And so what you ended up seeing was, was this beautiful diffraction pattern that looked like this. And so it was, excuse me, I said diffraction pattern. This is a beautiful interference pattern. So you saw this beautiful pattern of this light interfering. Okay. So we set up a screen behind, and of course this light shone through and produced this very strange kind of interference pattern. And in most modern day recreations of Young's experiment, instead of using two pinholes, we use two slits. And basically, the, these bands are numbered m equals 0, which would be basically the first nodal line. And then we would have m equals 1 here, m equals 2 here. So these represent the integer number of wavelengths. So this would be two waves arriving at this spot, which would be shifted by one wavelength. This would be two waves arriving at this spot that are perfectly shifted by two wavelengths. This would be perfectly shifted by three wavelengths, and so on and so forth all the way out. Okay? So basically what happens though is that intensity decreases, and this is kind of just um, an effect of, um, of this interference pattern. And so what we'd like to do now is we'd like to say, all right, that's kind of what we're looking at, and that's what's going to happen. And we can see this if we, if we were to do this experiment with a little laser. And we will do this. We'll do this in class so that we can actually visualize and take a look. But let's try and figure out how we come to this, and let's try and formalize it so that we can get some equations to work with, so that we can find out, okay, 
you know, the slit separation, how does that affect things? What about the wavelength of the light? All of these things we'd like to know. Okay, so I'm going to do some derivations now. And I would encourage you to sit back and to appreciate more than get stressed out about these derivations because, you know, for the most part, we're, it's important that we know where things come from and it's important how we set these things up. Um, but these derivations will give us a sense of kind of why we can use the formulas that we're going to use. So here we go. Here is a, a spot on a screen that represents a maximum. There would be several, several, several maximums. So these two waves of light are meeting at this spot, at this point, P max, P M. And basically, slit one and slit two are allowing light to come through. And the, the two beams of light are meeting here, and they're creating a maximum. Okay, The slits are separated by some width D or some distance D. And so basically, we know that this line segment from this maximum to this slit minus the distance from this maximum to this slit the, the difference in these um, lengths has to equal some integer number of wavelengths because if this is a maximum then we know this has to be true okay so PMS1 is basically the path length from PM to S1 and PMS2 then would be the path length from basically PM to S2 so we know this, and so here's our formula. Basically, we can say, okay, well, the difference in path here minus the difference in path here is equal to some integer number of wavelengths. Okay, but this isn't very helpful because it's very difficult for us to be able to find this experimentally. This would be a very difficult thing for us to find in an experiment. We'd like this to be a little bit easier. So on to the next part of this. Let's write that relationship, that path length, basically in terms of this angle, basically an angle that we give to the maximum. So continuing on, again, you can just continue this diagram because it's exactly the same one. But basically what we do is we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at this section right here. And we can say, oh, well, the path difference between these two, really the path difference between these two things here and here, if this is the same, then this is the path difference. And what we can do is we can call this, we can define this, some angle theta m. And so if we do some trig here, d sine theta m is equal to this path length. So now we've actually been able to describe this difference in path length in terms of our split, our slit separation, which is d. And theta m is basically the angle from the slit to a line defining the path difference. Now, one of the things that we can also say is that we can use some um, triangle trigonometry, um, and we can also say that theta m doesn't just have to be this. Theta m is also the angle um, basically to this point, and we'll show you how that works in a, little, in, a, in a couple minutes. But basically, we can also derive an expression for the distance any maximum is from the central axis. So again, here is a very similar diagram. But here, instead of drawing a point from here to here, we'll just simplify this diagram. We'll take one path from here, from the middle to the point. We'll call this distance right here xm. We'll call this distance right here l. Of course, this angle in here would be theta. And so the tan of theta m is equal to opposite over adjacent. So this angle in here is theta. So it's the same angle that we defined before. We're just doing a little bit of similar triangle work. And what we can say is, is that for small angles, sine theta is about equal to tan theta because these angles will all be very, very small. So we can simply say, oh, sine theta m is equal to xm over l. And there's equation number three. Okay. So these are the three equations that we've basically just defined now for constructive interference. And so it should be noted that we can also use those three equations to find the location of any minimum. But in, then instead, if we're finding minimums, and we're not going to be using m lambda, because m lambda would occur to, would apply only to, to maximums, we would then use the exact same three equations, but we would use the condition for destructive interference. And so all of our equations would shift to 
m plus one half lambda. Okay, so let's see how we're going to use these in a few um, uh, in a few examples. A monochromatic source of 450 nanometer light illuminates two slits that have a separation of 3.0 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. What angle does the first order maximum occur? Okay. So this is what we know. Because there's some lingo in here that we need to unpack. First of all, I'm asking for the first order maximum. If I'm talking about the first order maximum, I'm talking about that very first fringe next to the center fringe. So that means m equals 1. If the slits are 3.0 times 10 to the 6 meters apart, I'm talking about D, which is the separation of my two slits. I know the wavelength of light. It's 450 nanometers. I'm asking for theta m. What's the angle at which the first order maximum occurs? All right. So here's our equation that governs theta and D. And because I'm talking about a maximum, I'm using the formula for m lambda, not m plus a half lambda. And I can pop in my numbers, and I can solve. And we get 8.6 degrees. Now, all of this is very straightforward, but one of, the, one of the tough parts about these types of problems is that we need to unpack the question and say, OK, well, what does all this mean? Because I need to now choose my equation wisely. I need to understand what first order means. I need to know what maximum or minimum I'm looking for, all of these things have an analogy. So let's take a look now at another equation. We'll see if you can try this. Right? We'll see if you can do this. Monochromatic source of 450 nanometer illuminates two slits, 3.0 times 10 to the 6 meters apart. Find the distance to the third order maximum if the screen is 1.3 meters away. So now I'm talking about the third order maximum which means that m is equal to, and you should be saying 3, because it's the third bright fringe from the center. The screen is 1.3 meters away, and I'm looking for the distance to that third order maximum, which is x3. Basically, the distance from the center fringe to the third maximum. And so here, we have our equation for, again, constructive interference, because we're talking about maximums. So we're using m lambda and not m plus a half lambda. And we're going to use this version of Young's equations. And we can now substitute our known values while well, we actually rearranged here. Substitute in. And we find that this is actually about 59 centimeters um, a distance away. Okay, So the third order maximum is 59 centimeters away. This is the beginning of kind of using um, these equations to solve problems. And um, your homework and basically time in class and the labs that we're going to do are going to provide many more opportunities for us to kind of um, set up different situations and look at different things.